This is The Joe Gaither Show on BamaCentral.com. Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa. You're at World West Alabama. How are we doing today on this Monday? It's a happy Monday all from The Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. Hope you guys had a great weekend. I did. I had a really exciting weekend myself. Enjoyed some Alabama baseball and softball. Obviously, baseball losing two out of three to the Auburn Tigers. But the softball, goodness gracious, the Alabama softball ladies really got things going. And that's what we'll talk about today. Before we get into the show, I want to invite everybody to jump on and join us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. That's where you can watch the show live or you can watch it on the Bama Central YouTube channel right there at Bama Central. We're proud part of of the Bama Central Broadcasting Network, kind of part of the of the Walsh Writing Network. We're going to uh, expand today just a little bit, get into our expansion with a friend, Austin Bidwell. Austin Bidwell covers the Kansas City Royals. He's been on the show before talking about the Missouri Tigers, but my man Austin Bidwell is now working on the Walsh Writing Network with Inside the Royals. And we're going to talk about Major League Baseball on the back half of the show with Austin Bidwell. So we uh, look forward to doing that with him. And you can join us on the comment section if you like Major League Baseball, if you want to talk about Royal specific, Brave specific, whatever you want to get into with Major League Baseball, Austin's going to be your man. And he's going to be joining us meh, about 12.30 or so. So 15 minutes, he's going to be joining us. But first, we'll talk about Alabama and really get you going from the weekend. Weekend recap. As always, you can jump in on the comment section at Joe Gaither 6. Send me a comment, a question, query, or complaint. You can download, rate, subscribe to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Amazon. And we appreciate everybody who does that. So let's get into it. We'll have a couple of Alabama topics, and then we'll break into uh, Major League Baseball with Austin Bidwell. Let's start. We're going to go with a little softball recap. The softball ladies really had things rolling. We want to set up the SEC baseball tournament. Uh, gets going in Hoover tomorrow. We will be all over your Alabama coverage on BamaCentral.com. Myself, Kim Rankin, Matt, uh, Matthew Gibson, and Will Miller. Really, Kim and Will Miller are the baseball leads. Matthew and myself will supplement them. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about the SEC tournament. What's a realistic expectation for Alabama? Uh, look, you guys know all the SEC is really, really challenging. Alabama has had a really difficult time winning on the road this year. And they suffered uh, that same fate this weekend. They lost two out of three down in the Plains to Auburn. They ended up, yes, winning the Saturday game. Oh, my gosh. After a very lengthy lightning and rain delay uh, late in the game. I think it was in the eighth or ninth inning uh, that the game was delayed. Uh, and the Auburn Tigers, I guess, and the SEC didn't want to punt on the result. They hung around and restarted the game at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, to play one final inning uh, to close out the game. And so Alabama taking one out of the three down there in the Plains. But qualifying for the SEC tournament, we'll talk about their their standings and their, uh, their p- prospects of going far in Hoover this weekend. But let's start with softball. We'll go softball, we'll go baseball, and then we'll hit two football recruits that committed over the weekend. Softball, goodness gracious, we had Katie Wyndham join us on Thursday. We appreciate Katie Wyndham and all her coverage. Katie, Matthew, and Will Gibson, Will Miller, excuse me, Matthew Gibson, Will Miller, were out at the uh, at the Rose House this weekend covering all things Alabama softball. And honestly, I don't know that the weekend could have gone any better for these ladies and for the team. You've heard Patrick Murphy over and over and over for the last couple of weeks. Oh, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The girls have better ahead of them. Uh, And goodness gracious, Patrick Murphy, your experience, everything that you've gone through, you think we should listen to the fellow? You think we should get behind him? I know a lot of people have been upset about maybe the direction of the program, and we talked about that on Thursday with Katie Wyndham. You can check out that episode on all the platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever you like, as Katie Wyndham brought us a lot of good information about Alabama softball. But if you're living under a rock on Friday, Alabama beats uh, UC Upstate 1-0, to and you're thinking, oh my gosh, same old Alabama. One run, just one run. You made the pitcher be perfect, and they were. Caleb, Caleb, uh, Caleb Beaver was pretty much perfect on, on, on Friday, uh, holding down the circle, not allowing a single run, and Alabama softball was able to win on Friday. Great, one to nothing. You're, you're, you're rocking and rolling. 
And then on Saturday, okay, it's more pulling teeth. You beat Southeastern Louisiana five to three, but I believe you it took it what late extra innings. You had a five run inning uh, to, to to basically break the game open. I think this was in the ninth inning. Uh, let me flip over, yeah, in the in the ninth inning, and then uh, Southeastern Louisiana answered with a couple of runs of their own, but not enough to uh, not enough to get the win. And so, boom, you have somewhat somewhat of an offensive explosion scoring five runs in the late inning and Patrick Murphy basically imposes on his team we want to keep this thing rolling we want to carry this momentum into Sunday and it cannot speak enough about how important it was to get to the Sunday game 2-0 yeah you had Clemson in the regional you never had to, you never had to see him Clemson was uh, upset by southeastern Louisiana and really just kind of uh, floundered and Southeastern Louisiana looked like maybe the second best team, and, and at points looked like the first best team in the regional on the Friday and Saturday. But then Sunday comes. Sunday comes, and goodness gracious, everything you've wanted to see out of this Alabama offense was right there on display. Nine runs, nine runs in the first inning, a 40 minute half of the inning, a 40 minute bottom half of the inning, basically slams the door on southeastern Louisiana right off the bat and the ladies score their most runs uh in a single inning than they than they have basically all year uh and and so what they batted around everybody got on base it was great uh and and the ladies win what uh I had 12 to 2 12 to 2 in five innings when was their last run rule game that they were on the, the right side of oh you have to go back to march 19th against samford the samford bulldogs they beat samford 11 to 2 so the ladies really 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 exploded on Sunday in that first inning and kept things going. Obviously, it was a shorter game with the five innings uh, because they got up on top of them pretty quickly. But that's everything you wanted to see out of this team. The pitching has been there all year. They say, oh, everybody, the people who haven't paid attention, oh, replacing Montana Fouts is hard. Montana Fouts are replacing us. Yes, it is hard. And goodness gracious, it's not uh, something that's going to happen overnight. But you look at the staff, Jocelyn Brisky, Kayla Beaver, you, you, you look at uh, basically the, entire, the entirety of the staff, and they more or less replaced Montana Fowles effectively this year for Katie, one of Katie Wyndham's points. But the offense just never got going. Nine runs in the first inning on Sunday, and you listen to the ladies after the game. They say, oh, we changed up our approach from Saturday to Sunday. And so whatever it takes, Adam Bowman, the, the, the hitting coach, let's keep with uh, the, the same approach that you had uh, on Sunday as you're going into Knoxville. Seven SEC teams made the, the, the final 16, uh, the Super Regionals. Nine, if you want to count Oklahoma and Texas. So nine out of the 16 teams in the field have SEC ties. Now, a lot of them are going to be playing against each other this weekend. And so obviously not uh, nine will not make will, will not end up making it all the way to uh, Oklahoma City for, for the uh, College World Series. But the ladies, you're peaking at the I mean, you're finding your offensive uh, your offensive uh, momentum right at the right moment. And maybe. It had more to do with Southeastern Louisiana's pitching, but I'm going to choose to uh, – I like to give credit to the winners rather than slam the losers. And so for Alabama, I think that it's great to find the momentum. You score a bunch of runs in the top in the top half of the ninth inning on Saturday to really close the door and, and, and ultimately get to Sunday undefeated. And then on Sunday, you'd never really give your opposition a chance to get into the game. And I just think that is uh, exactly what you want to see. Now, you're going up to Tennessee, and it's going to be a very, very challenging weekend because, you know, Tennessee, number one seed in, uh, number one seed in, the, in the softball, in the SEC softball tournament, uh, you lost to them five to nothing, two to nothing, and you won one to nothing. So you scored one run in, what's that, seven, 14, 21 innings of action right here at the Rhodes House. This was in April, late April. It's going to be a huge challenge this weekend, but from an outside looking in perspective, uh, from a casual observer, I think that the ladies had a great weekend, had a great weekend. And look, whatever happens up there in Tennessee, don't get swept. Maybe I mean, do your best. And ideally you're, you're able to take two out of three, but go out there and leave it all on the line. Go out there, 
Give it your best shot. Don't get swept and, and, and let the dice roll and see, see what happens uh, at the end of the weekend. See if you're, you're upsetting the Tennessee Vols uh, to go to, to Oklahoma City again. And if they go to Oklahoma City again, all the noise is mute. Well, not it's not muted, but everybody who talks about, oh, the game is past Patrick Murphy by, you've seen it in the comments. You've seen it in the comments of any any softball post or any uh, softball story. Oh, Patrick Murphy's running down the program. They're foolish. You're fool. I mean, you're foolish anyways, because the program just got to Super Regionals uh, and has overcome one of its more difficult offensive seasons <laughs> ever uh, to get to the Final 16. And look, Everybody, everybody uses the easy thing of, oh, fire the coach, fire the coach. But then never think about who you're going to replace the coach with, who you're going to go hire. You fire somebody, you got to go hire somebody. Uh, so the noise should be muted, uh, should be turned way down, turned from seven down to zero uh, after this weekend. And whatever happens this coming weekend up there in Knoxville, Obviously, you're going to be able to pay attention to it right here on BamaCentral.com. The game starts on Friday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the ladies will get after it. But whatever happens, the season, I think, has been largely a success. You replaced probably your most prolific player in in program history. Uh, obviously, there's other other candidates that you could maybe uh, have arguments with, but with with Montana Fouts. But over the last five years, uh, over the last ten years. Montana's in that top three, at least. Uh, Haley McClenny uh, among, among them, but but and Kelly Kretschmann as well. But like he's she's in that top three. You replaced one of your top three best players in program history, and you still made the postseason, and you still qualified for super regionals, and you overcame probably a historically, at least for the program, bad offense to do so. So. Kudos to you, Patrick Murphy, and we'll see what happens this weekend. And uh, obviously, we will be behind you here at Bama, uh, right, right here on the Joe Gaither Show. Uh, you can follow all the coverage at Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. Katie Wyndham's going to be all over it. I don't think she's going to be up there in Knoxville in person, but she's going to be covering everything for us at Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. They're going to get going, probably have an, a, an open practice here in Tuscaloosa that you can follow her coverage on. Patrick Murphy's probably going to speak a couple of times in Tuscaloosa. You'll follow her coverage on that as well well and we will be all over it as a staff at bamacentral.com so congratulations to the uh, to the ladies let's 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 turn it over to the men sec baseball uh let me see if i can pull up an easy bracket here uh for us on because i've got one on my phone but i don't want to be staring at my phone the entire time that we're talking about this alabama baseball finishes the season and earns the number seven seed in the sec tournament they're going to be playing on Tuesday. They're going to be playing the second game on Tuesday. It looks like I'm going to have to do this on my phone, and that's A-OK. We're going to pull up my photos because I took a photo of the bracket, and we're going to be right – oh, I guess we're not going to be in that category. We're going to be right here. All right, so Alabama is playing in the second game on Tuesday, and they're, pl- they're, they're, ended up, they're going to be playing South Carolina. Uh, and look – <laughs> I think that Alabama baseball for a first year coach, Rob Vaughn, has uh, done a pretty good job, especially considering the circumstances that they've had with the pitching staff. You lose Riley Quick. You've had a lot of uh, challenges on the front side of the pitching staff, the starters. Uh, and so you're going to be playing South Carolina. It's a single Tuesday is a single elimination day. The SEC tournament is very – no, it's not very, but it's a little complicated. Uh, as Tuesday is a single elimination day, and then you get into double elimination. So we're going to get rid of what? One, two, three, four different teams on Tuesday, and then everybody's going to advance into uh, Wednesday, and we'll, uh, we will we uh, will get into double, double elimination play. One thing to note, Missouri and Auburn – didn't make the tournament. Falling off, thirteen and fourteen. Sorry, bye bye. You are out of the tournament. You didn't get. You don't qualify for Hoover. So Alabama finishes seventh in the in season. Not bad. You know, I mean, not really not bad for, for a first year coach who's dealt with several uh, major injuries and replaced a lot of guys from uh, last year's roster turnover. And obviously, you have uh, turnover after the Brad Bohannon scandal and then the transfer portal hits, and you got to go basically. Replace a third of your roster. I think that uh, that Rob Bond's done a, a fantastic job. The tournament opens up on on Tuesday at nine thirty in the morning at, at Hoover. So hopefully you guys are going to be able to get there. We'll be up there early. 
for you at BamaCentral.com and Cowbell Corner. Uh, my man Jacob Bain will be help, will be helping out with Mississippi State. But thir- uh, Tuesday kicks off Georgia LSU, six seed Georgia, eleven seed LSU. That's your little appetizer, and then Alabama comes on. Seven seed Alabama is taking on ten seed South Carolina, and so we we go back to uh, what March, late March. Alabama's playing South Carolina right here in Tuscaloosa. At the time, South Carolina was ranked number ten in the country. You guys all know SEC baseball is the biggest bear in college athletics, I think. Uh, Sorry, no disrespect to SEC football, but the baseball is deeper and stronger. You win 4-3 on on Thursday night. You win 13-6 on Friday night, but then you lost a tough game on Saturday uh, 9-8. Right here in Tuscaloosa. So he took two out of three against the Gamecocks. Uh, and, and so that lines up should be giving you a lot of confidence on Tuesday. That game will be what? Noon or so? Starting around noon. Uh, you can get into the Hoover Met. And, and I suggest you get there early because I, while I do love the SEC baseball tournament, sometimes getting in, uh, getting into the Hoover Met is a little bit challenging just because of the traffic flow. Uh, I think the uh, the officers do a, do, a, do a very nice job, and the organization of the event is very good. The volunteers that are there directing you to the parking spaces is very good, but just with the heavy flow, it becomes a little bit challenging. So get there early if you're trying to see Alabama and South Carolina. Alabama-South Carolina is a 7-10 matchup, and then you're going to have a small break, and you'll have Vanderbilt at Florida, uh, Vanderbilt 8-seed, 9-seed Florida at 4-30. And then after that, the nightcap, Mississippi State, uh, five seed Mississippi State against twelve seed Ole Miss, and we'll I'll be uh, participating a little bit in Cowbell Corner coverage for Mississippi State with the Walsh Riding Network. So single elimination. So what are we expecting for Alabama? Win on Tuesday. There you go. Must win on Tuesday. After that, roll the dice. Whatever happens after that is basically going to be gravy. If you win on Tuesday, you get to the double elimination portion, and you're sitting right there with the Arkansas Razorbacks, and you're thinking, oh, great. Yeah, Arkansas, number two seed in the SEC, and that's going to be a challenge. It is going to be a challenge. Oh, how did you play against Arkansas this year? Oh, gosh, I'm looking at the Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. you, you won your series against Arkansas home game series. You lost three to five on that on the Thursday night or on the Friday night. Excuse me. You won four to three in extra innings on Saturday, and you won five to nothing on Sunday. This is April, April fourteenth, so month and a half ago. But it's not going to be easy. Once you get into the Wednesday day, it's basically going to be all bets are off because everybody. That's what two, four, six, eight. The last eight teams in the SEC tournament. Uh, it's not going to be very easy. And Arkansas will have the benefit of sitting on their tails uh, on on, th- on Tuesday while Alabama burns what one two one, one to three pitching arms well, probably they're more quality excuse me they're more quality pitching arms because you want to get out of the Tuesday single elimination if you get to that Arkansas game on Wednesday you can you know, roll the dice you've seen you, you've seen them before you've won those games before but it's it's going to be a challenge and from there. What if you win, you will take you, you winner of game six. Winner of game six plays winner of game five, which is Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky will take on the winner of Georgia and LSU. So it's going to be not easy. What's this week mean for Alabama? What's this week really mean? I mean, look, you're pretty much locked into uh, NCAA tournament, basically set in stone. Uh, but you're also pretty much locked into a number two seed and a regional which means, unfortunately, Alabama's pretty much out on hosting a regional over here at Sewell Thomas Stadium. God, that was so much fun last year. It really was a lot of fun last year. But Alabama's pretty much out on hosting a regional. And so what can you really gain in a week in Hoover? Well, you can get out of the single elimination tournament and prove to yourself that you are a top eight team in the in the country's toughest league. And from there, you just want to have good – look, don't get don't, don't get your, your doors blown off. Put on a good showing. If you lose to Arkansas, if you lose to Kentucky, if you lose to some of these better teams, it is, is what it is. You want to basically play well enough to hold your head high enough to where if you're going to Chapel Hill or if you're going to one of these more difficult places to play a regional, that you're confident. Oh, I've seen the best uh, best baseball teams in the country. I might go to Chapel Hill, and yeah, North Carolina is really good, but every team I played for the last three months has been really, really good, and we're prepared for that. 
I think for Alabama, it's basically just important enough to win the Tuesday game, get out of uh, the single elimination bracket, and then just have fun. Because let's face it, let's be honest with ourselves. Does, does Alabama have a good chance of winning the whole dang thing in Hoover? No. It's going to be really challenging to do so. And if they do, it'll be special. It'll be special and it'll be awesome. And we'll t- we'll cover it at BamaCentral.com. But the likelihood is fairly unlikely. So you just need to play well enough to hold your heads high enough uh, so that the NCAA selection committee leaves you on the number two seed line. It really, really going to be probably impossible to get up from the two seed line to the one seed line. Uh, and so from you, you want to hold your seed line, play with some confidence. Don't get anybody injured. Don't have any uh, nicks or knocks. Don't have anybody, uh, you know, pull a muscle or have something bad happen. And uh, just have a lot of fun in Hoover because it is a fun event. Uh, get yourself, t- you know, two, uh, three to four games up there in Hoover. Maybe, maybe you sneak an upset over the Razorbacks uh, in that second round, and you just roll the dice and have a lot of fun. So we'll cover it at BamaCentral.com starting tomorrow morning. SEC baseball starting with Georgia and LSU at 9:30 over at the Hoover Met. Hopefully you'll join us at the Met. It's a great event. It's a great event, whether you're an Alabama fan or a fan of any of the other SEC teams or just a baseball fan. It is a very, very fun event. Uh, We'll see if the Vandy Whistler makes his way to Nashville if he does, or excuse me, to Hoover if he does. Maybe we'll punch his lights out because that guy is a little bit annoying, but... Outside of that, it's a lot of fun. I'll be drinking as much Dr. Pepper as I can. We love SEC events for that. Myself, Kim Rankin, Will Miller, we're we're probably going to – and Matthew Gibson – We'll have a little contest whose bloodstream can be most diluted with Dr. Pepper. Last thing for us before we get our friend Austin Bidwell on is going to be with recruiting. Alabama football had two fairly nice wins uh, on the recruiting trail this weekend. Neither of them in the upcoming class. Both of them are rising, uh, rising juniors. So Alabama already dipping into the class of 2026. And now you think, oh, well, you had a couple 2026s. You did. You did have a couple 2026s until Nick Saban retired. Nick Saban retired and guys like Zakai Hilton uh, decommitted from the class. And you've got to, you basically got to restart the whole 2026 class. Understandable. These guys are young. They still got 18, 19 months until they can sign letters of, letters of intent. But Good news for you, the Alabama fan. The Alabama Crimson Tide basically gets two defensive backs. Both of them look like they're going to be corners, but uh, Jamarian Gordon might be able to might be playing safety in this uh, in this defense. Let's start with Jamarian Gordon because he was first on Saturday. Jamarian Gordon out of Jackson High School in Alabama, uh, four star recruit, six foot, one hundred seventy five pounds, ranked the number ten player in the state of Alabama, and basically has been on a very successful high school team and played as a freshman, played as a sophomore. He's going to be a rising junior this year. Also pretty nice little track athlete. Uh, Look, as a rising junior, I'm not getting excited about any of these guys that still have at least two years of high school football to play. But we are going to take note of it. It is the start of the class. It is the beginning of uh, the Kalen DeBoer's 2026 class because because he, he basically reset to zero. And... You get two defensive backs. You think about what's going on with this Alabama defense right now. You saw what Alabama had to do in the spring transfer window to, you know, bring a, a couple defensive backs in with uh, with experience. And you see the shift, obviously, the Nick Saban defense to the Kane Womack swarm defense, the 4-2-5. You want more defensive backs. It just makes sense. And and, and uh, so Maurice Linguist uh, going two for two, Saturday and Sunday, taking two DBs. Now, on Sunday, they dipped into Georgia. They dipped into the state of Georgia for Dorian Barney. Uh, Dorian Barney is right out of uh, is right out of Peachtree. What do I have? Uh, yeah, Peachtree Ridge High School. Uh, and he's ranked the number five cornerback in the entire class and the number 10 player, and uh, number nine player, excuse me, number nine player in the state of Georgia. So you get two highly rated cornerbacks, both of them obviously very, very young. They still got a lot of developing to do at the high school level. And you still have 18 months or so until they can sign letters of intent in December. So still a little early to get, oh, over the moon, excited about any of these guys. But nice and notable. One thing for me, I like Alabama. I like these guys uh, starting the class with an Alabama prospect, with an in-state prospect. Maybe that's uh, small-minded and myopic of me, but I do think it's important 
for the new staff to ingratiate itself with the state of Alabama, with the high schools in Alabama, and start to get prospects in the state of Alabama. You, you don't want to end up being, oh, man, you've heard the Husky Harson comparisons uh, about uh, about Kayla DeBoer, and I, and I think they're pretty much uh, unfounded and basically just coming from the Auburn side of the state that just want to uh, maybe nitpick a little bit. But that was Brian Harson's problem. He came to Auburn, didn't really ingratiate himself in the state, didn't really get to know the high schools in the state, and their recruiting suffered. And obviously you saw what was on the field after, <laughs> uh, as a result of that. It wasn't so good. Uh, Hugh Freeze trying to rectify that now. But I think that this is a, a strong start to the class of 2026. Obviously you got a long way to go, and these guys can change their minds over the next 18 months. But I think it's a strong start to get two defensive backs. You emphasize – positions of need you emphasize a position where you you know based on the structure of the defense you need a lot of dbs uh you need your five starters and you need five backups and a lot of depth behind them so it's nice to start the class with two defensive backs and one of them being from the state of alabama all right, so that's kind of your Alabama recap. We hit a little softball. The softball girls really knocked it out of, out of the park this weekend and probably had their best weekend. Patrick Murphy saying this might be my most satisfying regional win of my career. I mean, think about everything they've gone through. And sure, he he's seen the noise. They've seen the noise. Oh, you can't hit. Oh, you're, the game's passed you by. Uh, to bust out nine runs in the first inning of the basically championship deciding game. Had to feel so oh, – that dugout had to be on fire in the middle of that game. Uh, so excited for them, and we'll see what they do up there in Tennessee. We'll be all over the uh, the Hoover Met. We'll be all over the SEC baseball tournament this weekend, seeing how far Alabama can advance. Got to get out of the Tuesday game. Basically, that's the expectation. Get out of the Tuesday game. And everything else from there is gravy. We'll be all over that with BamaCentral.com. And we had both commitments pretty quickly on the Alabama on BamaCentral.com's website. Uh, we had uh, Jamarian Gordon and uh, Jamarian Gordon and Dorian Barney. So let's do a little experiment. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with a friend, Austin Bidwell. You've seen him on the show before. Austin Bidwell helped us out in January. I saw the link was in January, Austin, the last time you were with us. Uh, talk yeah, about yeah. Missouri. But my boss, Chris Walsh, is the man. And we're I'm, I'm coining this phrase right here on the spot for us. It's going to be the Walsh Writing Network. How about that? So I, I like alliteration. Chris Walsh has expanded his coverage from not only Alabama, BamaCentral.com. You guys all read us right there every day. Mississippi State, we picked up on some Mississippi State during the fall, during the football season. Missouri, we also picked up Missouri during the fall, during the football season. That's how we got to know Austin, and we love that. But now he's expanding a little bit further. Kansas City Royals are getting into Major League Baseball. We're getting into the NBA with uh, the San Antonio Spurs. We'll keep expanding colleges in the future, but that's where we're at from now. This is the, the Walsh Riding Network. And it's time for uh, for the Joe Gaither Show to get involved with the other networks and the other sites. So we're going to step inside. Let me change my banner real quick now that you're with us. We're going to step inside. Inside the Royals uh, is, is the website. And you guys can find it uh, inside the Royals, si.com backslash MLB Royals. It's right there. Uh, the fan nation. So, well, now it's a uh, minute media, uh, I, I believe, is the Royals, uh, is, is our affiliate. Awesome. How's it been, man? How, how, how was the, the rest of your semester up at Missouri and uh, what you what you up to in Kansas City? You know, it was it was pretty good. Um, I can say that after January, Mizzou sports definitely did not did not do well, you know. But, you know, Mizzou softball still going, you know, got to finish out a year there. It was pretty cool. And now we're back doing some cool stuff with the Royals, doing some stuff with the Spurs. So, you know, it's been exciting. It's been fun. All right, so you're living in Kansas City, and yep. uh, we saw we spoke on the phone over the weekend, and basically you outlined, "Oh, I've been uh, all about the Royals basically my whole life." So yeah. it sounds like uh, you were the perfect fit for Chris to tab to lead our coverage with Inside the Royals. And okay, as a baseball, all right, we'll just set it up. I'm a baseball casual. I will pay pay attention to oh the All Star games this weekend. Now I'm going to start watching baseball. We're not quite there yet. That's going to be what mid June, early January, uh, uh, July, 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 July. First week of July. Uh, all my Jays run together. First week of July or so. So we're not quite to midway point in the season. 
It was framed to me like, oh, we're getting involved with the Royals while they're on the ground floor. They're going to get good. they got a lot of good prospects. They're going to be uh, a good team to be a part of and be covering. People are going to want to be uh, talking about the Royals. But it sounds like they're ahead of schedule. Second in the AL Central right now, coming off a win uh, over, over the A's last night. Tell us kind of about the first third of the Royal season and just uh, where you're at in covering the Royals. Yeah, no, it's been it's definitely been a surprising start to the season. Um, coming off a sweep of the Athletics this weekend, um, it's always feels good when they beat the teams they have to beat. They've played some tough squads. They have some tough squads coming up on a road trip, um, and just the AL Central really as a whole has just been so good. So the fact that the Royals are a game and a half back of the Guardians in that division, um, they're ten games over five hundred for the first time in years. Um, the game before their last was the first time since Greg Holland finished the Mets in the World Series that the Royals had been over nine games, 500, since that time frame. Um, and a lot of it has to do with just buying into the right talent, buying into the you know young talent. Bobby Witt Jr. is obviously a fantastic, a completely revamped pitching core. Um, the bullpen has shown up when they need to show up. Obviously, you have guys like Seth Lugo, who I just posted a story about why he has a great shot at winning the Cy Young Award today. Um and there's just a lot of guys on that team that are playing either ahead of schedule, having revamped seasons in Kansas City, or we knew they were good and they are just proving that they're good. All right, so I'm uh, kind of getting my bearing straight on the Royals, and I see two names that st- stick out to me, and this is just from a standpoint of their names pop off their page. Vinny Pasquitano, is that how I say that? Pasquitino. Pasquatino. Okay, tell me about him because that name is going to be fun for me to say the rest of the year. Vinny Pasquatino. Yeah, Vinny is a great hitter, great first baseman, makes a lot of plays. Um, yesterday came into the game, bases loaded, pinch hit, first triple of his career, second time it had been done in Royals history after Emmanuel Rivera in 22. Um, so he just he brings a lot on the offensive side of the ball and on the defense side of the ball when he's switching in and out with Salvi. That's a great set of first basemen to have who makes great plays. Of course, uh, Salvador Perez is un- untraditional at first base coming from a catcher, but they've both shown and Vinny has shown especially that he can hit at the top of the order. He can play defense just as well as a lot of first basemen in the league. And as a prospect that's been developing over the past few years, he's been great i know there was an injury last year with him that kind of you know halted his development but he's shown them that's not impacted him this year and he's been fantastic for the royals and i think he'll continue to be fantastic for the royals and the second name is not to give all my alabama fans nightmares but hunter renfro doesn't play football uh <laughs> same name doppelganger tell us about hunter renfro uh, with the kansas city royals yeah, Hunter Renfro, obviously a guy that's been in the league for a while. He's you know not he's new to Kansas City, but he's not new to this baseball thing. Um, he's been a good you know it's always good to have veteran presence around young players and to be able to allow the players to develop around some of these older guys where he can come in and he doesn't have to play every day. He doesn't have to be an everyday guy. He can be someone who can fill in in the outfield, fill in. Um, at the plate when he needs to. And, you know, he might not be the flashiest guy. He might not be a guy that you're going to rely on to win games, but it's always important to have a veteran guy or a guy that you can look to in moments that you need him. Um, And he's been doing that. I mean, he's obviously not going to go out there and swing for silver slugger or being in the MVP race, but, you know, it's always essential to have guys that can just fill in and play positions when they need to. All right, so you've been covering the Royals this this whole year, and you've been uh sounds uh, been following the Royals your whole life. Yeah. Tell me, what are the three Royals that we should be that the national media, national people need to be paying attention to? Uh, if they're not watching AL Central baseball, they need to know these three Royals. Um, we can start with the one that you know I'm sure that even people outside the AL Central know. Bobby Witt Jr. is. You know, phenomenal. He has been just so good for the team, just got his contract extension. Um, and he's just, you know, he is what everyone says he is. He's extremely fast around the bases. He had a double and a triple yesterday in his first two at bats. He's, you know, great in the great in the field. He's playing well defensively at shortstop. And I think that he is genuinely in the MVP conversation as far as the American League goes. Um, maybe not as the front runner right now, but to say that he's in the top five would not be a crazy thing to say at all. Um, and he's just doing everything that everyone knew he could. Um, the second guy that I would probably talk about and a guy that I'm really big on, uh, Seth Lugo, 
Um, you know, tell us what you wrote this morning. Make sure you go read at insidetheroyals.com yeah. uh, our piece, Austin Bidwell on uh, on Seth Lugo, maybe in the in that Cy Young contention. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, he, you know, as a pitcher in the previous years, might not have been a top ace guy that he is with the Royals. But I think that over the offseason, he's a guy that's very in touch with his um, baseball metrics, his baseball statistics um, in terms of things like spin rate, exit velo, velo, um, just all of these numbers and statistics. And not to give away too much information, but – Just highlights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just a little bit. You got to go read it. Um, over the season, added six inches of vertical drop to his slurve, a pitch that only five pitchers even throw regularly. He's 8-1 and one right now – or excuse me, 7-1 and one right now through 10 contests. Um you know, very on pace with Garrett Cole's first 10 starts last year, the eventual Cy Young winner. Um, and he's just – he's been really good. He's been fantastic for the Royals. He's had one bad performance that resulted in a loss. But since then, he's really been lights out and is one of the best pitchers not only for the Royals or in the American League, but in the entire American League or MLB as a whole. Um, the third guy that I would say to watch out for – um, a guy that maybe not a lot of people know. Another pitcher is Alec Marsh. Um, 3 0 in the season so far. He's kind of the third, fourth guy for the Royals, just coming back from an injury off a line drive. But he's really been good for the team when he's played. Um, he hasn't necessarily had many bad outings. When you look at his statistics, the way that he's played teams, he's been very efficient for the Royals. He's been someone that the Royals can turn to after, you know, you get out of that first two guy rotation of Lugo and Reagans, you get into that Alec Marsh territory, that Brady Singer territory, where both of those guys have excelled and been great. Um, and I want to see Alec Marsh do it more because I think Brady Singer is a little more established in the game and for the Royals. So if Alec Marsh can come out and continue to play like he's played, then he will make the pitchers on the Royals, the starting pitching rotation, just immaculate more than it's already been all right so like we've kind of framed you're right at a third of the way through the season baseball is a funny game where you've seen teams i mean i'm thinking about the phillies last year they were bleeping terrible for the first uh, quarter of the year and then obviously you got into the world series and it made some noise What's the likelihood of keeping it going? What are the keys? What are the keys to keeping the positive season going? Maybe you don't win the AL Central, maybe, but 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 keeping yourself oh in the contention and in the conversation all the way through uh, August. Yeah, and I think that the Royals as a team have structured themselves in a way that that's not going to be an issue if they can continue to do what they're doing now, which is. You know, they're a team that can hit home runs, but similar to the 2015 team, they don't need to hit home runs to score. Um, they scored eight runs yesterday without hitting a single ball over the fence. They're just a team that can get them on, get them over, get them in. And that's kind of been the Royals' motto and slogan for since 2015. So when you're built on a team like that, or when you build a team like that with guys that don't necessarily need to show their power to score, you kind of take away the risk of running droughts of power and not being able to score. Um, the biggest, you know, concern for the Royals, though, is that they – tend to score a lot of their runs in one inning. Um, you know, they're not very consistent through the game in terms of putting up scores in multiple innings, but when they explode, they can explode for five, six runs at a time. Um, and I think that that can be unsustainable at times, but if they can, you know, continue to play the model of baseball they're playing, there's no reason that their pitching the way that it's been can't drive them to at least a deep playoff run um, at the very best. And I think that if they continue to beat the teams they're supposed to beat, like the athletics, um, you know, then there's no reason this team can't be playing some meaningful baseball come this fall. All right, so you got a three-game set with the Detroit Tigers coming up right here, right there at home in Kansas City. Tell me, one, what are you expecting out of the series? Uh, you wanna, uh, you're on a three-game win streak. You're going to take two out of three against D Detroit. And then secondly, more, more about you, Austin, how difficult is it covering a team game in, day in, day out, 162 days? Yeah. I know you're kind of split on the home games, but you're involved in all of them. Uh, baseball's a marathon. How's that been for you personally? Yeah, so, you know, um, it hasn't been too bad so far. Just, you know, uh, I guess we're not fully into it. I guess we'll see as we go down, you know, just being a fan, being a fan of the team for so long and just really loving, you know, everything Royals related, the stories that they have, the the way that they play baseball. It's just been, you know, it's been awesome to see how it all operates. It's been awesome to cover them. Um, it's an honor, obviously. So you never want to take anything for, like that for granted. So uh, every time I'm, I get in there, I'm just so excited to be able to write about it and to share it with people. Um for the Tiger series, honestly, 
this, this is a team, um, like I was saying before, the AL Central is a tough, tough con- or division. Um, they have four teams that are 500 or above in the conference at, or out of, in the division out of five total teams. You know, the White Sox are obviously the outlier. But, the White Sox. Yeah. <laughs> but when you, when you look at a team like the Tigers, they might be fourth in the division, but they're still a 500 team. So um, they have a guy who is also contained for the uh, Cy Young and Tree School. And you never want to just say you're going to go in and sweep somebody or expect to sweep somebody. But I think if the Royals do want to play meaningful games in baseball, these are series that they have to win, considering they play teams like the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Rays, the, you know, all these tough teams coming up. You have to take series from teams like the Tigers if you want to play meaningful baseball later in the season. All right, so a lot of my uh, audience is probably more inclined to be watching Braves baseball and Phillies and Mets and kind of right here in the NL East. Yeah. So let's step outside the Royals just a little bit. It doesn't have to be in the NL East for you. What are the three maybe most – what are the three biggest surprises for you in baseball this season? Yeah, I think the first one um, is the Yankees' ability to continue to be a – dominant team without Garrett Cole this season. Um, they've relied a lot on Nestor Cortez, who's thrown up in the top five innings of most yes, in baseball. Um, you know, it obviously helps when you have guys like Stanton, Soto, Judge, batting back to back to back. But, um, <laughs> you know, hitting – we saw it in San Diego. is not always the end-all, be-all. So the fact that they're able to produce a pitching core that can, you know, stay sustainable without having Garrett Cole – just makes me wonder and makes me really think about how good that team can be when he comes back and he uh, is able to get back in that rotation and be a problem. Uh, I'd say the second one, probably a little less uh, less positive, is the Astros. They just – this season has not been kind to them. Um, you that know, makes me so sad. It, yeah, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, they just – they haven't seemed like – they seem a little like a shell of themselves. A lot of it has to do with the pitching. Um, they've had, I mean, injuries of their pitching. They obviously just had the suspension of um, Ronell. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name. A uh, young pitcher for the Astros got ten game suspension recently. Like they've had their their struggles with injuries, and I mean, Jordan Alvarez seems to really be the guy on that team that's keeping his, you know, keeping his thing going. Um, but as a whole, that team has just looked lackluster from the years previous um, as a whole. And I think this is Blanco that, yeah, there, there it is. And I think the, the third um, surprise as much as I don't want to go back to it, is the AL central, because whenever you have a division that, you know, I don't think was widely regarded as one of the best in baseball. When you think of the Tigers, you think of the Royals, you think of the teams like the twins. Um, obviously there's respectable teams in the division, but Nobody expects the four teams in that division to be over 500. So the fact that they've all, you know, really showed out and shined, um, especially producing multiple playoff contenders in the Guardians and the Royals, um, I think that that's just been awesome to see the turnaround of that division. All right, so if uh, any of our listeners are driving through Kansas City or we're picking up new listeners in the Kansas City area uh, who are like, okay, what am I going to do with my summer? There's a home baseball game in Kansas City What's it? What's a unique or special part, a special thing about those Royals home games? About the baseball park, or maybe you see fun things on the concession stand menu, or what? what what's obviously the team being good helps, and that's yeah. an attraction. But what's some reason for people to go to the, go, go to the ballpark and watch these next three games against uh, against Detroit? Yeah, I mean, I as someone who's been to the last few games, I can tell you that there is nothing better than the atmosphere in Kaufman when the fans are going crazy. Um, you hear it when you know Vinny Pasquantino hits the the triple down the first baseline. It's the crowd erupts, the the giant, you know, the Kaufman crown in the center field with the fountains. It's just it's an experience, especially with the team looking to renovate their stadium and relocate. I think that people who don't get to experience it are going to be missing out a lot on you know a lot of great experiences, a lot of great memories in that stadium. Because as someone who grew up going to that stadium, it's it is one of my favorite stadiums in baseball. Someone who's visited or has tried to visit a lot of stadiums, um, and a lot of that could be nostalgia, but also it, you know, it's just you know you, when it's gone, everyone's gonna miss it. It's kind of like the old Yankee Stadium, and just you know something something about it to experience it now and to really appreciate it now. We've been talking to Austin Bidwell of Inside the Royals. You can make sure you're following him at Austin from KC on the Twitter machine for all his coverage, Austin. 
What's your opinion on the 999 challenge? <laughs> the 999 challenge. That sounds like a stomach ache to me. That's, that's <laughs> what that sounds like. Uh, yeah, sounds like a stomach ache and a really expensive Uber. So, I, so you're, uh, you're out on it. Obviously, obviously, you're working all of these games. Yeah. But if you weren't working, you, that's not something that you'd be going to the ballpark for. No, I can't. I can't say that I would. I would indulge in that. You know, maybe on maybe on Dollar Dog Night, you get me to get a few hot dogs. But I don't know about nine. That's a that's a feat for sure. Okay, all right. So I see that on social media all the time, and I'm like, I could do that. That's not challenge. That's not hard. Yeah. I could do that. Well, Sounds like a bad morning the next morning, but oh, for sure. <laughs> All right, so last thing for us, and this is just like big baseball picture. For the people who barely pay attention to baseball, the main story that they've seen this year is the Shohei Otani gambling translator story. What do you make of all that? Is the gamble – was Shohei Otani's translator just uh, siphoning out money to gamble? Did he have a problem? Or did he just cover for his uh, superstar friend? I'm – I never, I never like to speculate on things like that. You know, they, they said that it was not Shohei, so I'm inclined to believe it's not Shohei. Um, I'm also, you know, don't really want to miss out on this talent that Shohei is, you know. So if the interpreter was willing to go down for him, that's none of my business. And I, they said what they said. So that's probably all I got on that. All right, no worries. All right, let's get you out of here on this. We're gonna, uh, The Royals are going to be playing Detroit th- this week. What is the story that you are going to be kind of looking to tell? Obviously, the win and loss, that's basic. What's the story that you're going to be looking to tell on Inside the Royals this this week? Yeah, so a matchup that I'm really interested in this week is um, Tree School versus Cole Reagans. Um, Reagans, obviously, Royals acquired in a trade last season with the Rangers for Ronald Chapman. Um, has been kind of the number two guy for the Royals. Came to the season, a lot of people thought he was going to be the number one guy uh, before Lugo obviously came in and did what he is doing now, but – that's going to be a really good matchup um, between both sides. And I think that's going to be one of the uh, deciding games, you know, for the Royals to see if they can beat elite pitching in the American League, if they can hit against elite pitching in the American League. And I think that's a perfect test for the Royals to go out there and prove it. Austin, thanks so much for your time, man. I know you probably got to get, get to the ballpark pretty soon. Three big games against the Detroit Tigers this week. You're going to be able to follow Austin Bidwell at Austin from KC on the Twitter machine. Make sure you do that for not only your Kansas City coverage, all your baseball and, and Missouri coverage as well. Part of the Walsh Riding Network. Austin, thanks for your time. We'll do it again hey. next week, man. Thanks so much, man. Yes, Have sir. That's Austin Bidwell, and that's going to do it for our, for our, for our uh, Monday show. We're going to do things like that more in the future. We're going to probably be expanding to uh, San Antonio Spurs. We'll get in touch with some of our Missouri friends to find out about Eli Drinkwitz and his offseason. We'll find out about what's going on with Jeff Levy and Mississippi State with our Mississippi State friends as we expand the show into other genres. I appreciate everybody's patience uh, and maybe willingness to jump into these other genres with us on the Walsh Writing Network. This has been the Joe Gaither Show. Our home is on BamaCentral.com. We're going to talk about Alabama pretty much daily. That's going to be my my, my, my specialty. But we'll dive into other sports topics around all kinds of sports, pro, college, uh, and whatever else suits our fancy. We'll get out of here for the day. You can always follow us at Joe Gaither 6 on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, whatever you like. You can follow us on any of your social medias at Joe Gaither 6. You can find the show on Bama Central's YouTube channel. You can find the show on Spotify. Apple Podcasts and on Amazon. We're going to be all over SEC baseball tomorrow. Probably bring you a show as early as possible tomorrow so I can get up to Hoover to watch Alabama take on the South Carolina Gamecocks and see if they can get out of single elimination day tomorrow in Hoover. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for joining us. Tell a friend about the show and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of the Joe Gaither Show right here on Bama Central on BamaCentral.com. Thanks for joining us on today's edition of The Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. Keep up with Joe on all his social media pages at Joe Gaither 6. Subscribe, rate, and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and be sure to read us daily at BamaCentral.com. <laughs>